School of Architecture at Yale University. She worked as a practicing architect in the USA and Israel and had her own practice in Haifa until the mid-1980s, at which time she joined the Technion in a full-time capacity. Since the end of 2010, she, has, she is a professor emeritus. She taught a large number of design studios and theoretical seminars that reflect her research areas, which are design cognition, visual thinking and sketching, analogy, and design education. She served as a visiting professor or visiting scholar at MIT, Stanford, TU Delft, the University of Montreal, UNIST, and Bezalel Academy, Bezal Academy of Art and Design. Her publications include dozens of reviewed journal papers, book chapters, papers and conference proceedings, and two books, edited volume, design representation, and lincography unfolding the design process from MIT Press in 2014. She continues to lecture around the world and supervise PhD students at the Technion. It is with great pleasure and honor I invite Gabriela Goldschmidt to the stage for her keynote lecture. to try and uh, connect between uh, uh, the design process, research, and uh, design education, which I understood to be the topic of this uh, conference. Um, and I hope you will bear with me if, from time to time, um, I treat design very widely. I know most of you are designers uh, who come from industrial design or related fields, but I'm an architect, and for me, design includes a host of other design disciplines. So what will I be talking about today? I'm going to talk about the design space, the knowledge that uh, is used in the design space, which I hear for this purpose uh, divided into uh, three, cognitive knowledge, general knowledge, and disciplinary or domain knowledge. Um, I will want to present a very tiny little case study which exemplifies the, um, the role of specific disciplinary knowledge, specific design knowledge. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about design learning the, uh, and in particular the acquisition of a disciplinary knowledge since this is really what this uh, entire talk uh, turns around. So what is the design space? And why do I want to talk about it? Actually, the term design space is, was coined in artificial intelligence, not the field of this community. This was in the 1990s. And it typically uh, denotes a space, of course, a, a virtual space or a um, uh, metaphoric space of possible designs for behaving systems. It's a very sophisticated and abstract definition. We won't go deep into it. But what we want to pay attention to is that uh, Alan, New uh, Alan Newell and uh, Herb Simon talked about a problem space and a solution, solution space in, in problem solving already at least two decades earlier. I'm sure you're all familiar with their work uh, about problem solving. And what they um, included in the um, problem space was a state of, uh, was a number of states of knowledge and operators that allow us to use this knowledge. Um, and these operators, the operators are, are the way in which uh, states states are changed and constraints um, are, are uh, removed from applying operators. In architectural design, the concept of problem space received a wider interpretation um, and is very often related to the search space, which we believe every designer uh, walks around in in the uh, early stage of idea generation. We conduct a 
the search. In Zen literature, you can find evidence uh, for a combination of the problem space and the uh, solution space. The most well-known paper in this regard, which I'm sure most of you know, is by uh, Case Dorst and Nigel Cross, already 18 years ago now, um, but still very, very relevant to us. It combines the two spaces. And we can consider this combined space um, as a design space. Now, the design space has a lot of uh, similarities with what Donald Chern, the late Donald Chern, called a design world. And his uh, claim was that when we uh, deal with an architectural uh, or other design problem or situation, we navigate within the design world, which is what we know, what we're familiar with, um, what we think the possibilities, the optional uh, solutions that we can possibly generate uh, encompass. It might be interesting to note, I'm saying this really in parentheses, that uh, the notion of design world comes from uh, really from uh, a philosopher, Nelson Goodman, who wrote this wonderful book, which if you are not familiar with, I really recommend very warmly from the 1980s, uh, Ways of World Making, by which he uh, talks about the fact that, that we each, and also as a community, we create uh, our own little world in which we live, um, in this case professionally, of course, and of course, this is a dynamic thing that changes in time. Now, our, our design world, as I said uh, earlier, comprises knowledge. And uh, I'm talking about the three kinds of knowledge that uh, I already mentioned, cognitive, uh, general, and disciplinary knowledge. And by knowledge, I, I of course mean explicit knowledge, but also implicit knowledge or tacit knowledge, it can be declarative, it can be procedural, and it also includes skills. So this may be debatable, but for the purpose of today, um, this is what I mean by knowledge. So I want to give you a few examples of uh, published work on, um, on um, solution spaces or problem spaces or design spaces, just because it's such an interesting and useful term to think of what we do as something that happens within a space. And it, this is a space that changes all the time with our experiences, and it can be widened with everything new that we learn or that we do. This example, which goes all the way back to 1985, is by John Habracken, who I think was uh, one of the more, more brilliant, uh, in this case, architectural design theoreticians and he um, uh, started distinguishing between uh, well-designed problems and uh, well, I'm sorry, well-defined problems and uh, uh, well-defined problems in which the definition begins to be questioned and ill-defined problems. So um, where the problem is not at all well-defined, um, we won't go too deep into this, but um, you can look it up in, in, in his uh, uh, publications. So you already um, describe different situations where we as designers um, within a space um, can move from one situation to second to third. Uh, and uh, this is a very dynamic thing and it depends on what we know, on the nature of the problem, on how well we can uh, remove obstacles, etc., etc. Here's another and maybe simpler example from uh, Rosamund and uh, John Giro, Michael Rosamund and, and John Giro, about a decade later, where uh, he says that there is a, a, a space, this upper, upper circle on the top, of, uh, of solutions that theoretically are possible, but the ones that we can possibly, uh, with what we bring with us with our package is, is uh, uh, a little bit more uh, 
constraint into the smaller black circle there. Um, and uh, within that, we can find our solution. It's within the established possibilities that we can uh, uh, deduct from the design space that this, pro this particular pro problem uh, uh, lives within. But there are some uh, situations in which we can possibly think of something completely new that is beyond what can be expected in the realm of already established knowledge. And then we have maybe an idea or a proposed solution that sits a little bit beyond the normal boundaries. No one has thought of that before. And then this um, idea will sit here, outside of this circle. And what happens is that we can redefine the circle or the space, really, the design space, and enlarge it to include this, this uh, new thing that creates a possibility or an opportunity for novel and uh, probably, hopefully, creative uh, solutions that no one has thought of before. Yet another example. Um, you see that the, the red dots represent uh, knowledge that is already existing and within the space, uh, and uh, the pink dots up above uh, are things that we discover. We discover ourselves, new things. We they are connected to what we already know, obviously. I mean, we cannot think of something new that is in, in no way connected to what's already known to us. And this creates a much, much larger space, the outer rim of this shape here, than the one we started out with, the, the small one, this little amoeba here, which is what we started with. So we discover new opportunities, it enlarges our space. And I think this is the last one where we see uh, that uh, actually if there's more than one space in here, um, we, th these uh, researchers suggest that depending on the problem and the discipline it is with, we might have more than one, one space in which the, uh, the, the problem may be researched. And each of, the, of these subspaces uh, centers or focuses on something else, and then there are links between the spaces and between particular pieces of knowledge in, in each one of them, and then together they create a network which um, becomes very, very rich, and that's our new uh, design space for that particular problem. So I would again want to stress that the, the, we each live at any given moment when we, of our work life, of course, we live without, within, within a space that is relevant to the problem that we're tackling at the moment. But not only does it change from one um, assignment to the next, but it also changes within the same assignment as we learn more about the problem, as we try out and explore more possibilities, as we hopefully expand the, uh, the, the uh, design space, it, it keeps changing. So the notion of a, of a design space, I think, is a, is a useful one to, in order to describe and analyze the particular types of knowledge that serve us in our um, design search. So the, the, the initial design search is part of the uh, design process, and I'm showing you here um, two very simplified models of the design process. The, the first one on the left is something um, I published, um, as you can see, a long time ago. I'm, I'm pretty old, so some of you were even born then. Um, and it talks about um, um, a linear process. Oops. Wrong button. Yeah. Uh, a linear process 
it goes this way, where you start with some, some kind of a definition, even if it's a very, very fuzzy one of, of, a, of a design uh, problem. There are some imperatives, uh, that is maybe a brief, there are givens, there are things we know already. Uh, it goes then to this stage B, where B is where you interpret the problems, because of course we know that B gives the same uh, task or assignment to even 100 designers, and uh, no two of them will interpret it in a similar way exactly. Right? So it undergoes an interpretation. Of course, there are many things that happen between A and B. We're not going to talk about them right now. And at the end, you produce some sort of a design solution, in this case an architectural uh, uh, design solution, which has a, uh, a shape and uh, has properties and so on. And um, the, the idea here was that in between the initial givens that um, are not really the ones that the designer came up with, you know, someone is the commissioned the work, someone provided information, someone wrote a brief, someone, in the case of uh, architecture, um, um, allocated a particular site, and this site has properties, it has a topography, there's a specific climate there, and so on and so forth. So those are things that we usually have no control over, but then comes this element, this supposed to be alpha, this alpha, which is our own wishes, beliefs, values, um, something that is completely outside of what we were given at the outset. And that, of course, is very important in the way we interpret the uh, assignment and, and uh, thereafter what we do with it. Maybe we're interested in a um, in particular aspect of the project, uh, be it technological, be it aesthetic, be it social, be it economical, um, stylistic even, whatever it might be, it um, feeds into this process and helps us um, create, at the, at the very end, a proposal for a solution. So a few years later, on the right, uh, more or less the same model, um, some, some with different uh, terminology, with the um, one addition, which is this uh, beta on the right-hand side here. And this talks about uh, the design process in the studio, where you're not on your own as a designer, in this if you're in the studio, you're a student, but there is the uh, instructor or the coach, I prefer to use the term coach or the teacher, um, someone who helps you become, uh, become a professional designer, and of course, uh, this person, he or she, has an impact on what, on how you think, what you bring to the um, uh, process of uh, solving the problem, and um, here, the idea is that both your own wishes, something that comes from within, and what you achieve, or what you are able to do with the help of a teacher, that is something that maybe the, teach, the teacher helps you do what you were possibly not able to do yourself yet, operates uh, on two levels. First, as before, it feeds into the, the initial idea generation stage where um, uh, you arrive at an interpretation that is right for you. But then, later on, in between that interpretation and the production of a solution or maybe a few alternative solutions, uh, once again, both you, but also the instructor, feed in. And the reason I'm, I'm showing this here today because I'm very interested in particular in this here, also in this, because 
We want to talk about education, so we want to know how the um, coach actually helps one become a designer, a full-fledged designer. And um, I'm going to uh, claim that at least part of what the coach helps one achieve is the discipline, disciplinary knowledge, be it in architecture, um, industrial design, engineering design, which is also a design domain, although we haven't mentioned it much here, but uh, definitely is. Um, and we will come back to that a little later. So let's look at the three types of knowledge that I specified here. Start with, we'll start with the cognitive uh, design knowledge and skills. So I've listed here a few uh, uh, examples. Um, these are cognitive abilities that we have as uh, people in the society. We didn't learn them in design, in design school. We mostly come with them. Of course, they get a boost in the process of education. So these include the collection and classification and so on of, of, of uh, information that is relevant. Um, the seeing, and this is the one that I'm going to center on, seeing and identifying connections between pieces of information that um, are not obviously connected, but we begin to see connections between them, and this helps us um, arrive at a more novel solution. So of course this is connected with idea generation. We generate ideas and these ideas um, build on the information that we, that we um, had before and the one that we have collected in the process. The idea of being, the ability of being uh, critical. So we look at what we have in a critical manner and uh, we have to be able to be flexible enough and abandon those search directions which don't lead anywhere, which is not always easy for designers, by the way. But um, this is a, a very important cognitive um, ability for learners. And um, last but not least, and we want um, we want to develop this further, the, the ability to switch between divergent and convergent thinking. So you know the diamond shape uh, model, in this case, apply not, not the different types of uh, uh, properties of design, but um, diver divergent, convergent, divergent, convergent. Um, the smooth switching between those is also a cognitive ability. So everyone has cognitive design knowledge we all can do these things to some degrees or some degree or another. And um, you might say that this is really um, innate. I said I would center on the connections uh, between information and ideas, which can be captured in linkographs. This is an example of a linkograph. Um, unfortunately, I, I can't uh, develop this theme. Some of you know about it. If you don't, you are invited to look it up in the literature. Oops, this is a very sensitive remote. Um, the idea here is that you can um, map connections that you make in the process of generating design ideas um, and uh, generally the search for a design solution, such that they all come together because we all know that a good design is not a bunch of solutions to separate problems, but an integrative solution that combines all of them in a way that they're not really separable. And in this example, you see a, a process with a, a number of steps how do we know it? Because we ask people to think aloud in, in controlled experiments. We have people perform a little piece of design. Uh, we ask them to think aloud. 
and we uh, can record that and um, then we have a protocol of that process. So we can see that from here to here, the number of uh, blue dots here, which represent links, is quite small. So in, in, the, in this period from 1 to 14, uh, these are called design moves, but they can be anything else. They can be a list of ideas that were generated in this period of time. They can be a list of decision, decisions made during this period of time. But they largely stand on their own, and only where there is a blue dot connecting to them, um, a link is being created. However, here, from 14 to the end, 20-something, we see that uh, these moves or ideas or decisions are very much interconnected. You see lots and lots of these blue dots, which signifies that um, during the second half of this small piece of, uh, of a design process, the designers, an individual, not a team, although you could easily do that with a team, but they were able to interconnect their ideas or their, their um, the ideas that they generate or the, their decisions, etc., in a way that seems to be uh, very positive in terms of arriving at, at an integrated solution. So you see more of a synthesis here. So, of course, if you um, look at the process of a novel designer, let's say a first year student, and you ask them to do, some, to, to, to do this exercise, you give them a small problem, and in a minute I will claim that uh, novices, even on their day one in school, can already design. Of course, their designs are not exactly the same as what any one of the people sitting here would produce, but they do something. And um, when we record their processes, because they think about it, we will see that they have um, a, very, a very small number of links between what they do, because they've not yet learned to synthesize between things, to integrate things. However, when you take some who are very experienced, and in particular, people who are very creative, which we can check elsewhere to know how creative they are, um, we find many more links. And um, <coughs> we don't have time to go into this, but uh, maybe another time. So here we're talking about cognitive, capabilities that serve designers, um, both inexperienced and experienced. Okay, our next type of knowledge is um, general knowledge, and of course everyone possesses knowledge. Um, even little children do. And it refers to what we know about the world. Everyone knows a lot of things about the world. And um, of course, as we uh, experience the world, um, the amount of knowledge that we have about it uh, grows all the time. It is, of course, uh, um, influenced by, by environment, by, by the kind of society we live in, cultural factors, etc., etc. But we know things and we acquire more knowledge uh, with time. Um, and we take this knowledge, knowledge and we, in our minds, every time we face a task, and by task I mean, I mean anything starting with, I have to cross the street now. There's traffic on the street. When do I make the step? There's no uh, zebra lines, there's no uh, light the green light that tells me when I can cross, and I have to make, I have to reason when do I cross the street, depending on, on, on the traffic. So I have in my mind a small mental model of the situation, and that helps me uh, decide when to cross the street. Well, I know that um, I can do that only if the nearest car is at a certain distance 
away, depending on the force, the uh, uh, how, how fast the cars move. But of course, this is uh, a uh, simple task, and um, we learn to do that when we are young. Um, you know that mothers hold the hands of small children when they cross the street because they don't yet have enough of a mental model of the situation to be able to calculate correctly when the car is far enough so that they can cross. So this is something that builds up with time. But when we have to uh, um, design a vacuum cleaner, then um, the situation becomes a little bit more complex. We still, we have a mental model of all the of, of the goal of what we need to do, of, of how we need to approach the problem, um, what information to use, etc. Mental models, um, it's by the way a fascinating field of study that you are um, welcome to study more if you, if you haven't done so, because in that design space some of these uh, notions and concepts are so helpful in conceptualizing what we are trying to understand. So we have mental models which, which really consist of what we know, the relevant knowledge that we have to the task ahead of us, and um, it's built with experience, of course, and uh, like the spaces that we live in, it's very dynamic. Um, and um, we will come back to it in, in a second. The idea here is that um, everybody, everybody has general knowledge, everyone can store it, so to speak, in mental models and can use that to design. So I'm sure you all know people who designed their own homes without any design education or designed and built furniture for their homes, etc., etc. So people can do that. and. Um, here I'm showing you uh, a design, I, I think a lovely one by children. Um, this was a workshop in an elementary school and um, the children of the third and fourth grade participated in, a, uh, in this workshop where they were to design a house for Pippi Longstockings. Do you know the story of Pippi Longstockings? Who knows it? Every, almost everyone. Uh, it's a very famous children's story um, from Sweden, translated into many dozens of languages. Uh, uh, most children, at least a few years ago, used to love the story because they saw a movie. And anyway, in the story, Pippi, who is this uh, child who lives by herself and is very able, and her two friends and her horse and monkey run away from home and they um, uh, they roam about and they need a home. So the task the children uh, were given was to design a house for Pippi and her friends, including the horse and the monkey, of course. So um, um, these fourth graders, um, this is two kids who built, who built, oops, again, I made this mistake who built this house, and they explained the following. They said, oh, the horse, um, this is general knowledge, okay, that the horse cannot really climb stairs, so we'll put them on the ground floor here. And Pippi and her friends will live in the intermediate floor here, because there will be some stairs inside. The monkey, on the other hand, gets its home up here, and how does the monkey get there? There's a rope here, and, the and there's a seesaw here. So the monkey can run on the seesaw and lift itself, grab the rope, and climb into its little shelter up there. And um, the reason I show this is because it shows you what children already know um, about a bunch of things. They know about the behavior of some of the animals. They know about um, stylistic uh, architectural elements 
I mean, look at these, uh, look at these um, elements that they used here, like um, um, vaults and so on. And um, they used this general arch as the head, and they um, designed the house. On the upper right uh, side, you see, you see another project in the same workshop where they didn't build the house. What is this thing doing? But they uh, they designed the interior uh, with furniture and even dinner plates, etc. So uh, already at this age, they're nine to ten years old. They're their own interpretation of the task. They bring a, they bring knowledge with them. They decide what's relevant and what's not, and they um, come up with the design. Now. This is what we really want to get to, is professional design knowledge, which um, the children don't have, and some, some of the people who build their own houses only have to a very limited extent, etc., etc. Um, the disciplinary or domain knowledge is encompassed in the world that we're living in, and it um, really has to do with values and goals, it has to do with traditions and rules, and therefore uh, my disciplinary world coming from a particular place on earth might be different from someone who lives on the other side of the road, uh, in a different society, etc. There are conventions, standards, methods, technologies, materials, etc., but also a, sp a specific language that we talk in, the terminology, uh, we face the problem of novice student, at least in my school, um, who are absolutely thunderstruck by the terminology used by the teachers, because although they know the language, they don't understand what the teacher means when he says, oh, this wall talks to the hill across the valley. They don't understand this terminology. And it takes them some time to um, um, to um, uh, become members of the community that uses this particular language, particular terminology, and most importantly, particular representations, be they be they graphic uh, drawings and uh, also three D ones, because the, the, they are very different from discipline to discipline, and uh, that, again, takes some learning, and I will show it to you in a minute. Let me show you a few, just a few examples of, of uh, the difference between um, the world that designers in different fields sort of live in and the kind of representations they use, and I want to use um, um, a spectrum of disciplines from ones that some of you may actually call crafts and not designs, but I think they, are, they can be designed, all the way to digital ones. So here, you look at metal uh, working, which can be at different scales, and the kinds of drawings they produce, a lot of, they, have, they deal a lot with welding and uh, connecting large elements, there's a lot of metal uh, folding, etc., etc. Et um, architects have a different kind of world. They uh, live in a world which contains spaces and volumes, and they uh, use a lot of hand sketches uh, of different kinds. Industrial designers here, of course, mo mo most of you know better than I do, um, the, the type of drawings, the, the drawings that industrial design um, industrial designers use are more 3D than the ones, for instance, that architects use. Um, the production of 3D models nowadays can be uh, printed out, etc. And uh, mechanical engineers, or engineers uh, in general, um, there are uh, 
respected uh, colleagues in the design community, um, and they have a slightly different uh, view of uh, their world, which deals a lot with all kinds of mechanisms that maybe is not as prominent in other design fields. And when you are a member of a community in one of these disciplines, you uh, don't always know well the world of the other disciplines. I'm showing you this picture for a purpose. This is the world of semiconductor design, a very, uh, uh, economically speaking, a very important and uh, profitable um, branch of design. And they have their own mode of representation. You see it on the right. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but they know how to read these drawings. Uh, and it talks about the layers within a chip. Here, this is, this is a chemist and, uh, and uh, a computer science person, etc., etc. And uh, they try to find out what went wrong and then they try to fix it. And um, it turns out that sometimes these teams work for months on end and find a very find it very hard to communicate with one another. And one of the major reasons for that is because they don't understand each other's um, drawing representational language. Each one does something else. The, the um, chemist doesn't understand what the mechanical engineering is drawing. The mechanical engineering doesn't understand what the, um, the computer science person is drawing, etc., etc. So this is a very crucial aspect of disciplinary knowledge. What kind of representations are we using? Um, here is what someone said about the differences between the disciplines. Um, industrial designers generate user-centered solution concepts, and engineering designers solve design problems based on technical perspectives. I don't know if this is always true. It may not be always true, but um, it gives us a direction to think about the uh, differences. There are also differences in terms of personality. Um, we know that in, in uh, counseling that people seek for um, uh, professional orientation. A lot of people say, I would like to learn to acquire a profession, I would like to learn something, but I don't know what to learn. So they go to, uh, to counseling and uh, uh, they're, they're, they emerge from there with a certain profile of, of personality which says you might do well in this and this or another profession. So it turns out that when you post fact post when you look at people who are in different disciplines, um, you will see that the tendency that di different personalities are attracted to different professions. This, which I don't expect you to read, of course, is a comparison between um, what goes on in the studio. We're now approaching education, which is um, what I want to talk about in the time that we have, which is not long. Um, we had the good fortune to participate in a um, in a um, conference that um, Robin Adams convened together a few years ago where um, her university generated a huge volume of recordings from studios in different design disciplines, including engineering, chemical engineering, uh, industrial design, and, and, and a number of others, and we added to that uh, architecture which wasn't in the original volume, and we looked at what goes on in the studio and uh, in terms of the learning objectives, the pedagogical strategies, the crit critique uh, and review contents and purpose, and uh, we tried to compare because there were similarities between what went on in the, in the different disciplines, but there were also differences they can be quite different 
And this is a summary of, of what we found. Um, again, you, you can read this now, but I'm sure you trust me that there are differences along with the um, similarities. So here is a very small, really tiny case study. Um, you see this, uh, what shall we call it, piece of sculpture. It's very old. It uh, comes from uh, Polynesia. And, uh, it originally was on a stand. It was connected to a stand which sat on the floor with three steel rods. You can see them here. Later they were removed. So this is why you don't see them on the left because they were removed. And the question was, um, how do we hang it on the wall? The reason these steel rods were removed is because um, it was decided that it could no longer sit on the stand rather on the floor, but it should be attached to the wall. So the question was, how do we attach this on the wall? It's complete, the shapes are so irregular, there's no straight line there whatsoever. And a number of people um, looked at this assignment. The first one was a metal worker. So here are some sketches. Oops. I'm touching something. I don't know what I'm touching. Uh, the metal worker thought about something that has to sort of uh, embrace the piece um, on the sides and somehow be attached to the wall with some uh, rods that go into a little pocket that is attached to the wall. More or less this idea. Then it went to an engineer, a mechanical engineer, and being an engineer, he thought about a small little little um, mechanism with um, a piece that is attached to the wall, and then there's these slots there, which uh, slots here, um, holes for slots, and uh, there would be uh, something attached to the to the piece of sculpture in the back, and it will then go through these uh, holes and with the slots you can adjust it. Uh, so that it is uh, upright, and um, this was his idea. And this is the designer's, the industrial designer's idea, which was you uh, attach to the wall a simple L-shaped uh, uh, bracket, and you use these special uh, bolts, which are called uh, hanger bolts. I don't know why, but this is what they're called. And then you see, I'm sure you've seen them. These, they have a regular wooden, um, uh, wooden, regular wooden screws on one side, and then they have um, metal screws on the other side. So you screw them into the into the piece of sculpture from the bottom, and then you have holes in the bracket that you've attached to the wall. And you, on the other side, with the help of bolt, you can again adjust the the height. And this was the simplest solution, and it was also the one that was executed. And here it is. Um, and of course, the reason I show you uh, this is because you see this, the simplest of problems, yet when you come from a, a one discipline or from another discipline, the way your mind works, uh, if you're an experienced designer, is different. Um, everyone is a designer, but the, the solutions are different. Of course, question mark today with a parametric design. I'm asking this, and I don't have an answer to this. Is parametric design a way to circumvent aspects, not all, of disciplinary, disciplinary knowledge? I don't know. Maybe you have the answer. I don't. Um, part of, of uh, this presentation it has to do with learning and education. How much time do I have? Ten minutes? Okay. Um, so in this, in all design, in all different design uh, disciplines, we, we, uh, we have studios. And uh, for most students, the studio is, is absolutely the heart of their education, and uh, of course, I would agree with that. Um,
how is knowledge passed on from other students and from the coach to the learner? Um, of course, we have a normal crit situation where um, the coach will refer the student uh, to, to examples and will um, make suggestions, ask questions, all of this we know very well. And uh, importantly, we'll also help with drawing, with exemplifying by drawing. Because as we've seen, the representational model is very important. Um, I would like now to turn to educational theorists, in this case, mostly uh, Les Blotsky, who is uh, very well known in the, in the, in the world of uh, education who talked about what we, as coaches, give our students as scaffolding. In other words, the student actually teaches him or herself. And we don't do the work for them. We don't tell them exactly to do this and this and this and that, hopefully, anyway. But we make it possible for them by asking questions, by suggesting, by exemplifying, etc. We give them a scaffolding that helps them do something that they were maybe not able to do the day before, at least to try. Uh, so the notion of scaffoldings is one of Vygotsky's important contributions to theories of education, and I think it applies uh, perfectly in, in the studio, because in some ways, learning to design from the situation in which you're a complete novice until you become an expert, is somewhat akin to uh, the way you learn in school when you were a child. Vygotsky also gave us another um, very important term, which I think is useful, and it's uh, the ZPD, or the Zone of Proximal Development. What is the Zone of Proximal Development? It's a big words for something very, very understandable. Um, if you look at the illustration on the bottom right, as we know, the student, even if he's a complete novice, he already has a general knowledge, maybe he's already accumulated a little bit of uh, disciplinary knowledge, he has cognitive knowledge, and there's certain things he or she can do in this um, turquoise um, circle in the middle. Then, if the coach or some other more knowledgeable person comes along and helps, it extends the student's possibilities or abilities, and they can do more. So you see the second circle, they can do more with the help of someone who knows more than they do. As they progress, the, the ZPD shrinks and shrinks. I mean, it always existed. If even an expert has a certain ZPD, at least in certain areas, someone more knowledgeable can help them uh, achieve even more. But in education, this is very important. This teacher is, or the coach is there to help you bridge this ZPD and become eventually as knowledgeable as the teacher, uh, as the teacher is. Um, if we have only a few minutes, I think I will skip this. So, um, as we know, it takes quite some time to become a really competent designer, several years, uh, and you have to learn a lot of things, and um, I will, I will um, go directly to the quote on the bottom. I will leave the, what's up on the top relates to what the uh, uh, slides that I skipped showed. So, Let's leave that alone, but um, Chris Archers, who was a very important um, expert on education from Harvard University and later from the Teachers College at Columbia, uh, and was very interested in design and worked closely with Donald Schoen, who most of you know, and um, a quote from his work says, architecture thinking can be divided into things that can only be drawn and things that can only be talked about. 
interesting because we have the more abstract notions and we have the more physical options, uh, notions and uh, you have to do both. So this is why in a crypt people talk so much but they also draw. So um, I don't want to talk very much longer about the uh, importance of sketching most of what we draw actually uh, in that phase of learning and also in idea generation when we are full-fledged designers, um, most of what we draw is hand-drawn uh, hand sketches. Of course, now we also use uh, digitation. I mean, we use computers, uh, but peculiarly, the hand-drawn sketch hasn't really died. Some have predicted Um, this is really uh, an attempt to summarize. If we go back to this model that uh, I showed earlier from uh, about 14 years ago, um, the way um, our, it's just an elaboration of that part of our learning in between. Uh, the knowledge that we start out with in, within the design space and the interpretation that we come up with. We you know it's a process and it's, sometimes it takes time and there are things that influence it. So both what we bring from our guts and what the coach helps us with pertains to mostly disciplinary knowledge, but also the, well, the coach the coach on the right has an impact mostly on disciplinary and cognitive knowledge and cognitive because they can help us learn how to connect things and the, the um, um, links between the cognitive and the disciplinary. Of course, they stand on their own, but they're also, of course, uh, in, they interact with one another. And uh, our own um, input that is beyond that which the problem um, uh, guides us to impacts or is impacted and impacts at the same time um, general knowledge and cognitive knowledge and maybe less disciplinary knowledge. But then it all mingles in here to contribute to the interpretation that we came up with. So in conclusion, um, first thing to know is that knowledge designers design space consists of general knowledge and cognitive knowledge, and that's why you can give them a design assignment on day one of school. They do it. Then um, the professional designers, of course, consists of the general cognitive uh, knowledge that we've seen, but also the disciplinary knowledge, and that's the big difference. As they become in the uh, design world of their discipline. And where do we acquire this knowledge? We acquire it in the studio, as students. And um, it is, of course, augmented with experience and with our uh, willingness and uh, appetite for more of it, which may vary from case to case. And disciplinary representational skills, here again, are essential for learning uh, to actually take place. And if we want to do interdisciplinary work, it is also a good idea to learn to at least understand the representation of language of the disciplines that we're interacting with. Thank you. Thanks for that last slide on uh, the word disciplinary. I think in recent, in recent years we've seen a lot of expansion, if you like, of design and what design is into different disciplines, into different games, different territories. So, for example, say policy design or experience design, or even culinary design we heard about yesterday. If these disciplines don't have 
not only formal sort of modes of representation or even forms of representation, but what might be the transfer mechanism in these, or is there something inextricably linked between the definition of discipline and the modes of representation of a discipline? That makes sense. Uh, thank you. That's, that's actually a difficult question. But, um, you know, as, as someone who's taught many uh, design courses, including to novices, first year students, um, I, I know from my own experience and other people's experience, and not that I can prove it, I haven't conducted any research, but as a rule of thumb, let's say, it takes about a year to. Um, acquire enough representation of skills in one's own discipline to be able to use it um, um, to, to, to produce freehand sketches. In other words, not precise drawings where you abide by a rule, but, but uh, and uh, why is this important? Because sketching is used in, in um, idea generation and then you, the fluency is very much appreciated. But because the novice who entered the school today doesn't have that flexibility yet, that fluency yet, and some of them have never sketched before in their whole lives, what we've done in our school is to ask them to build models. And um, they've not done that before either, or at least most of them haven't, but that's something that they can learn to do within two days. And there's always someone there who is more apt at using a, a Japanese knife and, uh, and someone who understands the difference between a fast glue and, and, and another type of glue. And they um, have seen models, everyone has seen models, and they understand the notion of scale. So the first thing they work with when they have no other representational tool is um, 3D model. And not, not, I don't mean 3D. In, in the computational sense. When they um, take in, when they, either they learn it in, a, in an orderly way, some schools teach drawing, some, school, some, some other schools it's not done anymore, but they learn it um, you know, through experience somehow, um, they will start to use that. I don't know if this answers your question, but it's uh, um, um, less abstract because the, the uh, symbol language is actually much, much simpler and you use a analog um, um, translation from the object you are modeling uh, to what you're doing and that's easy and as you've seen children can do it as well. I, I've had five years of the models without a Japanese knife. <laughs> Looking at the earlier slides, in one slide uh, you use the terms creativity and expertise with a slash. Creativity and expertise with a slash. Do you think that um, expertise and creativity, are they correlated? Oh, absolutely and not. Do you think that sometimes too much expertise may become um, a challenge? You know? Too much expertise maybe may become a barrier. What do you think about the relationship between expertise and creativity? Thank you. Okay, very good question. Um, no, expertise and creativity are not at all the same. But um, in both cases, there is no much more knowledge there than uh, when someone is a novice. That was the only reason they they come here together. Um, I um, I think. Creative designers are, have to be experts. I think it's not possible to be a creative designer without being an expert. Um, if, of course, it depends on what we uh, what we define as uh, a, a real design. I mean, a, a child can design a rocket. Many boys do that, or they design uh, robots. That's now the thing. Children design robots when they're three year olds. You know, they take matchboxes and other things, but, and then they put these things together, and it will be a robot. So they design it. But of course, 
if you try to and everyone says oh what a genius you know this creative child etc etc but it, someone talked about uh, c1 c2 was it today or yesterday creativity one creativity two it's creative in terms of uh, what this particular person knew before and, and, and uh, what they arrived at in this art, which is referred to as creative. But it is not creative in terms of what it adds to the world. What, what, uh, so there's, there's the uh, individual dimension, there's the historical dimension, in fact, um, um, the name escapes me at the moment, but, the, um, but it was already in the creativity literature uh, a long time ago, this difference. Um, an expert can be um, um, a very good designer and not terribly creative. It probably is true, although I cannot vouch for it, that almost every design is creative, at least to some degree, but not every design is something that we that takes our breath away and is novel and we say, oh how wonderful, how wonderful. And also if it is wonderful, is it is wonderful the same as creative? Even that is not necessarily true. So what is create how how we define um, expertise is relatively easy. How we define creativity is much more problematic. But I don't think we can go into it here. But again, the, re the only reason I put this in here together is because the expert and someone who's very creative know, have knowledge that people who are less expert slash less creative don't at least yet know. to uh, design teaching. <coughs> How about the knowledge of teaching? Yeah. How would an experienced designer would get the knowledge of teaching <coughs> in the first place? Uh, and from that, maybe we can link this question because uh, nowadays, uh, to be an academic, you need to have the research skills as well. And you get such a training, research. you are trained to be a researcher. And it's not, uh, it's not the same thing as being a designer. So we have dif difficulty in engaging people, experienced designers in design teaching. So what, what do you think about this? Uh, yeah, of course, uh, one can be creative in everything in life, and certainly in design teaching, some people are more creative than others. Um, I don't think you can learn to be creative. I mean, I know this is a very disputed area, and uh, we can't get into creativity, really. Some people <coughs> think that you can teach people to be more creative. I think you can to some, to some degree, because um, we can just help people think in ways that they were not familiar with before. And that opens up new horizons for them. That's certainly true, but um, there's still this thing that comes probably uh, from up there, that either you're born very creative or not, and, you apply, and, and if you apply it in a field that really lets it develop, you, you can be, a, what is a creative design teacher I think that is very um, contingent on the particular situation. If, if uh, 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 probably, I mean, I'm improvising here. A cognitive, a, uh, a, cognitive, a, a creative teach, a design teacher is one who can get out of students more than can be expected. I guess who can motivate them and bring them to get out of themselves more than one would normally expect. I can attribute this to nothing else but the teacher's uh, 
creativity and i probably it probably has to do with first understanding the needs of each particular student because every student is different as we all know to devising assignments or exercises or whatever you want to call them that challenge what people are used to do so that it stretches their abilities it stretches their need to explore new territory as to the inborn conflict between design and the requirements in universities today to perform as researcher i think we can get into this here but it's of course a topic that is a sore point for many people and and it requires a different form to to try and dig into that i can give you one example of to come back to the first question of what i think may have been a creative move in a workshop in in cyprus turkish part of cyprus many years ago in a school of architecture there was this workshop where there were design design teachers architecture in this case architecture design teachers from many places maybe 10 of them participated in this workshop and there were students from the local school and there was an assignment to design something very small and the roles were reversed so that the teachers were given the task to do and the students performed as their coaches and teachers so each each teacher i must say here in parentheses some teachers refused they said they were too afraid to be exposed so what they had to do is to sit down and design their thing and the student was there to give them comments on what they did and this whole thing was going to take about 45 minutes and they couldn't stop because after that you know when it was finished of course the the results were of absolutely no interest what they were interested in was the process and people's reactions to this reversing of roles and then everyone gathered to talk about it and the building had to be closed and people refused to move they said that both the students who were there and the teachers who were there that it opened their minds in ways you know all of a sudden they began to much better understand what was going on with the other party so that that was an example you know you can all conduct an experiment of that nature in your own schools for the teacher to feel what it is like to be a student under a crit every week every week and for the students to have this kind of empowerment to be able to really say what they think and not be afraid to say the most extreme things and understand how you have to be careful about how you phrase your your answers etc etc and you can think of other exercises of this kind that are game changers maybe thank you uh, i want to ask uh, about the differences of the fields of industrial design and uh, architecture in terms of uh, scale because in industrial design education you have a tendency or it's better to have one-to-one -one solutions in terms of especially you were mentioning about the modeling issue so when you model something you have a chance to experience it as a prototype but in uh, architecture it's different what you whatever you do in the education is uh, bound to scale so what do you think about 
this difference in terms of this framework that you have given us? Um, yeah, you, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think um, that's part of what you learn as part of your discipline in uh, learning, that you um, have to bear in mind that in architecture, uh, you can almost never produce a one-to-one -one model. It's just something that you have to learn to see the things in a different scale, and therefore there are different levels of developing the project. It's a little bit different from industrial design, where you very often can uh, build a, a model or maquette, which is really one-to-one, -one, see the whole thing. It's, it's part of the conceptualizing process that differs. It, you're absolutely right. I should have uh, added this. I didn't think of it, but thank you. Absolutely correct. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. <laughs>